for the Wellcome Trust. Uh, Miranda Walport's going to give a brief um, introduction um, uh, to the mental health challenge area and uh, a little bit about um, uh, how we ended up with this commission and then we'll go through um, with the help of all of our collaborators around the world um, walking through some of our really exciting findings. If you have questions uh, during the conversation, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature um, or to raise your hand. Um, and we will have time at the end for questions and conversation as well. Also, during the conversation, um, Joe Scanlon um, will be dropping in from the Sage Bio Networks team uh, information into the chat with the links and additional information just because of our short time together today. We are not going to be able to get to absolutely everything. So look to the chat for uh, supplemental information and links um, as, as the conversation continues. Um, without any further ado, though, Miranda, why don't you kick us off? Thank you. And it may be me causing the echo. Can people hear me okay? And is there still an echo? No, no echo? The no echo. Is... You're good. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, just being uh, Miranda, the other Miranda in the room is just telling me to remind you that, uh, that we are recording. Uh, if that's not okay with anyone, please let us know. Otherwise, we will record. So thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I can't wait to hear from Meg and the team. Uh, and for them to share the results of this important project. I'm Miranda Wolpert. I'm Director of Mental Health at Wellcome. For those who don't know us, Wellcome Trust is a major biomedical research funder and we fund research to advance health and well-being more generally. We have a new strategy as of this year, which is to uh, support foundational discovery research uh, that will change health forever, we hope, of any stripe or sort any sort of mental health problem, any sort of physical health problem, uh, anyone can apply for that. And then we also have three key huge health challenges we are focused on. One is the impact and mitigation of climate and health, including mental health. Uh, the other is infectious disease uh, and addressing infectious disease. And the third is early intervention in anxiety, depression and psychosis as part of our mental health strategy. So um, we really want to encourage anyone on the call to have a look at our web pages. My colleague, who is also called Miranda, um, not everyone in Welcome is called Miranda, but a small number of us are, uh, will put details of the web page around uh, this. And we'll also put web pages around our strategy more generally in the chat so people can have a look. Um, just because of a slight glitch on our web pages currently, the information about the Mindkind study is not linked into the other areas of our, our web. It will be sorted very shortly but while it isn't you'll need to go through the url in the link for the moment we just want to share a, a couple of minutes just on the genesis of this project so what we really wanted to understand we really want to understand better how problems develop over time and how they resolve and we want to understand the complex interaction of biology psychology and social factors and to do that we think uh, mental health longitudinal data has a huge part to play in developing and advancing our understanding. So we've been thinking for some time about how we can get better longitudinal data to help support the mental health science community. And we're very aware that most of the data sets we have currently are very limited in terms of their, um, uh, the people in them, in terms of their diversity of the participants, and in terms of the models by which the people who are giving their data or sharing their data are involved or empowered to make decisions in relation to the use of those data. And then in terms of how we make, uh, they're also uh, limited in terms of the ability for many different researchers to make use of those data sets. So this is really the start of our journey to think about how we can make better use of longitudinal data, how we can fund and curate and enrich existing data sets, and how potentially in the future we can create new data sets. So we put out a contract uh, a couple of years ago to ask a supplier to work with us to explore different models of data governance, different models of data collection, and different models of making data open. And we were absolutely delighted with the application Sage BioNetworks put in with their partners in India, South Africa and the UK. And they've been an absolute joy to work with. And it's been a fascinating project. And really, at this point, I'm going to hand over to them to tell you what they have found. 
And just to say that we will share everything we can on our website. There are more reports to come. This is the first report. There's another report they've done on an additional piece of work that will come a bit later. Um, and we're really interested in your comments, questions and thoughts. Thank you. With no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Meg. Thanks so much, uh, Miranda Walport. We were so excited um, to get this commission and to do this work collaboratively with our partners around the world um, who we'll hear from today. So um, we're going to be hearing today from our professional youth advisors. Um, uh, Sweta, Rafilwe, and Emily uh, worked um, as members of our research team throughout the entire project, and they'll be um, presenting a little bit of their work to us. We're going to be hearing from our data wonks, folks at Sage Bio Networks, um, Carly and Sally um, did uh, the yeoman's work with uh, with all of our, our data collection um, and analysis. And then we're also going to be list hearing from our site leads, um, Sumitra, Zuki, and Mina um, will be presenting findings from each of their perspectives about their uh, lived experience um, and uh, with the project itself. So really excited for all of our speakers today. And again, I'm Meg Doerr. Um, I'm the Director of Applied Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research at Sage Bio Networks. So let's talk about the ask. Um, as Miranda uh, previewed, um, they put out a call, Welcome put out a call um, to prototype and test the best ways to build um, an inclusive mental health data bank uh, for youth that would be global. Um, they want it to hold longitudinal rich data at scale, empower those sharing their data, so the youth sharing their data, and enabling this um, cutting edge and cross-disciplinary um, collaboration. As I've mentioned, we have this really diverse team from around the world in the United States. Um, there are folks from Sage Bio Networks in the University of Washington in India, um, from the Center uh, for Mental Health Law and Policy, um, and in South Africa, both from Higher Health and Walter Sisulu University. In the UK, uh, two uh, little known universities, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. And then we had youth panels and data advisors. So uh, we had professional youth advisors, but we had youth panels that they led um, who enriched our understanding of this area um, and worked with us um, as researchers, as well as data advisors who are professional researchers um, who would be the target audience for a global data bank um, of mental health data like this, um, who also worked with us on the usability side. So this is our team. So a little bit about the design of the study. So we had that charge from uh, welcome, but of course, you know, you need to drill down and actually have some specific aims. So our real primary focus for this project was to research data governance structures that give real voice to youth. Uh, data governance is a passion of Sage Bio Networks. We've done a tremendous amount of work in this area, um, and we're so excited for this opportunity to engage with global youth around data governance. And what we mean by data governance is how data are collected and shared, the terms under which we gather, share, and use data to advance research, to advance solving. Um, we wanted these models to balance privacy and open science aspirations. SAGE uh, Bionetworks is an open science advocacy organization, so we try to share data as broadly as possible while still maintaining the privacy of our, our research participants. And we also needed to understand the, the legal framework for this. Um, as many of you know, um, the legal landscape is changing around the world. There's rulemaking happening all over the place right now around um, digital data and data privacy. And so we needed to explore those legal structures as well. We also obviously wanted to collect the right data for meaningful mental health research and, and, and gather data that are rich in information about different people, but not entirely focused on individuals themselves. And Welcome has already done some really cutting edge work in this area, which we built upon. So we used, for example, their active ingredient research within our work um, and to advance that as well. So the study design. The study had two arms, a qualitative study arm and a quantitative study arm. The qualitative study arm involved about 150 youth from India, South Africa, and the UK um, in two rounds of deliberative democracy conversations. So deliberative democracy 
is a, a methodology that's like a focus group only with the provision of education in advance so that people can make meaningful conversation. It's used for topics where people don't have a lot of pre-existing positions or knowledge, um, but might have some lived experience. And so we develop these educational materials with youth for youth. They viewed them in advance and then their conversation um, and uh, was enriched by that and then uh, their own lived experience. And then we worked with them to develop a consensus data governance model. These, the qualitative study arm was really focused on understanding the why behind youth preferences for different data governance models. Why did they feel the way they felt? On the other hand, we did a quantitative study arm. Um, so we had like 3,500 youth from India, South Africa, and the UK download an app onto their mobile device. They had active data collection, meaning that they had to engage with the app to add in data, and they could also opt into passive data collection. For example, information about screen time or about their exposure to daylight. We hoped for 12 weeks of participation. So these youth were randomized into four different data governance conditions. And then uh, further, we're randomized into two different engagement conditions. And so this really, the focus of the quantitative study arm was on the what of youth preferences around their acceptability, um, these different data governance models, and their preferences. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our youth advisors um, to talk a little bit more about youth involvement. Um, hi, everyone. Hope I'm very audible. Uh, yes, Suki. We had professional right. Yes, Rufila. <laughs> no worries. Um, so we had professional youth advisors from each country, full-time employees of each of the three sites, namely Shreitha from India, Emily from the UK, and myself, Rufila, from South Africa. And we had a research, we had research team members from each side, um, one youth panel group per country and representatives from those to a global youth panel group who were paid as consultants. Um, I'd like to hand this over to my colleague, Emily. Yeah, hi, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, touch on quickly the diversity of the youth panel. So, um, we each had sort of our own challenges in each country around uh, trying to recruit um, panels, uh, groups that um, looked as much like the countries as possible. Um, and in the UK, we um, we did. Hello. Oh, sorry. I thought. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, in the UK, we were um, uh, due to quite a big recruitment drive and getting over 300 applications um we were able to get a, a really great um gender split um as well as over half the applications that we got in being from people of color which was uh, fantastic and allowed us to create a really diverse group um however i do think um uh, some of the most marginalized people in the group were the most difficult ones to keep a hold of and i think um over the course of the group and that was something i think we experienced in all of the countries so that's a good thing to be mindful of when looking at creating groups like these thank you thanks emily and rafilwe um needless to say youth involvement was really critical to this entire project and we could never have done this project without the level of involvement that we had we're now going to dive into some of our data um, Carly and Sally from Sage Bio Networks are going to be presenting on data governance to begin with and then um, on engagement. So without any further ado, Carly, do you want to dive into the data? Yes, so I'm talking about our data governance results in this study. And just to give a quick definition of data governance, at Sage we tend to describe data governance as the freedoms, the constraints, and the incentives that determine how data is managed. So um, we did some preliminary work on data governance uh, that we wrote about in a green paper where we tried to look at different structures and, and models of data governance that are out there in the literature. But we recognized that it essentially boils down into this seven question typology. So we 
Yeah. So this seven question typology became the real cornerstone of our study, really of both arms. Um, and it became the questions that we asked participants in each qualitative focus group, deliberative democracy session. So I wanna go through each one of these seven questions with you because this is a novel typology that we created for this project. So the first question, who can access the data? Anyone, people with certain jobs, like maybe doctors or professors, people with certain skills, like perhaps computer programming skills, people from certain places, like maybe they have to have an IP address in India. Where is the data hosted? Maybe in one place, like a centralized repository, or in many places, like a federated storage model. Who controls the data? No one. The community decides. So uh, the community, be it researchers or participants, decide who controls the data. Perhaps there's a review panel made up of representatives of that community. Or the community could hire a manager, like a data steward, who manages the data on their behalf. What do people have to do before they can access the data? Perhaps they have to do an ethics training, provide their ID, get a review board approval, like an ethics review board or an IRB. Perhaps they need to sign a contract, or maybe they need to pay money, like they need to pay a fee to access the data bank. Who takes on the cost of managing the data? People who access it, so the data bank could be subsidized by those fees. The government, like the data bank is funded by taxpayer funding, an organization or institution, like a nonprofit organization, an NGO or a charity, or a private company, like perhaps a pharmaceutical company. How can people see the data? Can they download it? Can they view it in a server, like a browser on their computer? Can they view a recreated data set? Recreated data set is the term that we gave to synthetic data set, which is the term in the literature. A synthetic data set is a pretty um, innovative new concept that mathematically represents the shape of the underlying data, but without having a one-to-one -one relationship with the underlying data. So you can still develop computational models, but without revealing, um, you know, potentially revealing sensitive identifying information. So we call this a recreated data set in this study because we thought it was a little bit more clear. And then finally, what kind of research can people do on the data? Anything, certain types of analysis, like they can only ask certain types of questions or certain types of projects. So we asked these seven questions in each of our deliberative democracy sessions, and we asked participants to sort these different options that you see in these yellow boxes into acceptable, unacceptable, and maybe. And I'm going to show you our aggregate findings across India, South Africa, and the UK, um, as well as multinational sessions that we held, and that's on the next slide. So what you can see here is we have our seven questions across the top uh, on the Y on the X axis. Um, and then we on the Y axis, this axis actually captures acceptability as well as level of consensus. So what you see on the top, most broadly acceptable, these are things that were uh, you know, put in the category of acceptable by many people over many sessions. In the middle, these were things that were often categorized as maybe, maybe categorized as acceptable by a lot of people, but unacceptable by other people, or perhaps we couldn't reach consensus around these items. And then toward the bottom, you see most broadly unacceptable. So these are things that many participants felt were unacceptable. So as you can see here, you know, it's it's kind of a spectrum. There aren't necessarily bright lines about what options are acceptable and unacceptable, but there are certainly trends. Um, I'm only showing you our aggregate findings today, but in the final report, you can also see how it, these um, preferences are modulated by the site, um, by the particular site. So if we return back to our typology on the next slide, um, so we did some initial preference gathering with our youth panels and our data usability group. And these three questions that we have um, highlighted are the areas where we saw the most divergence in preferences between our youth advisory panels and our expert data usability group. So I'm going to pass it off to Solly as these three questions became the um, kind of cornerstone of the quantitative study. So uh, Carly will be back to tell you more about her results in a in a little bit, but um, we wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the um, quantitative results study, um, the quantitative study results. Um, so 
how this worked is uh, participants were recruited uh, largely online and they were sent to our enrollment website. Uh, please advance. Within the, the enrollment website, we actually have an e-consent, an informed consent um, uh, presented electronically. So participants uh, uh, have their eligibility checked and then they register their phone number. And from that point on, we can uh, track how they go through the informed consent, whether they finish the consent or not. Uh, please advance. Uh, with, within the um, informed consent, we actually had a randomized trial. Um, in particular, we uh, changed uh, parameters about uh, the data sharing so that we could actually do um, uh, statistical tests of preference and um, acceptability. Uh, next slide. So this is the design. Um, there were four arms. Um, the first arm uh, was participant choice. This is where we get to assess choice. Uh, and the other uh, three arms were fixed uh, data models where participants could either join or not join. Uh, please advance. Um, so this was the, the study recruitment. Um, like I said, we could track people who registered but didn't consent. So this is broken out into consented, those who actually joined the study and unconsented. Uh, in terms of enrollment, uh, those who consented, we had about 1,000 individuals from India and South Africa and about 1,600 from the UK. Uh, next slide. Oh, and I should say that those were largely um, folks who uh, identified as having previous lived experience with uh, mental health challenges. Uh, next slide. So uh, in order to assess the governance preference, we look at uh, group A. Uh, these participants were exposed to two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, um, how should researchers be able to uh, access the study data? Uh, with the options that uh, they can download the data set, um, that they uh, have server access only, they have to go to an enclave um, and can't download the data. Uh, and then the third was recreated data set. The second question we asked them is who controls access to the data? Uh, the first option is that participants vote on the data access parameters. Um, the second is a volunteer community review panel, and the third is a professional review panel. Um, you'll note that these don't align uh, 100 percent with the the qualitative study options. Um, that's because these were developed first, uh, and then the the typology was developed after that. Um, next slide. So. Uh, when we look at the participant preferences, uh, in some cases we see a strong preference that's similar across all sites. So uh, in this case, uh, participants in India, uh, South Africa, and the UK all preferred that their data be accessed on a secure server. Um, and with uh, very similar, statistically indistinguishable um, in most cases between um, uh, download and data steward or um, recreate a data set. Uh, next slide. Uh, in other cases, the option, the uh, preferences weren't so clear and differed by uh, country. So uh, when we look at who controls access to your data in South Africa, uh, uh, participants strongly preferred a professional review panel. But in India and the UK, um, there was uh, a statistically indistinguishable um, tie between um, democracy and professional review panel. Um, so uh, next slide. And we actually, when we model this by age, we can see that these preferences um, have a tendency to change by age where uh, the appetite for professional review panel decreases with age with older participants and uh, democracy increases um, with uh, with age. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in order to look at acceptability, we look at the next three arms, um, groups B, C, and D. These, these participants were all um, given a fixed model. Um, they didn't know that other models existed, so they either took the model that they were um, that they were presented or they didn't join the study. And so we look at the rates at which the, the people in these arms uh, join in order to assess the relative acceptability of these models. Um, so the first model is uh, researcher norms. This is kind of the status quo for, for data sharing these days. Um, in, in this case, researchers were able to download a copy of the data and the, the terms um, or the, the parameters by which they um, got access to the data were pretty standard. So these are like anyone can can um, access the data. There are no restrictions um, uh, as long as they were um, they were uh, qualified researchers. So they did have to um, prove that they're a, a, a real human being, for example. Um, in group C, uh, we um, this is more of an, a youth informed uh, model in that the, the, these were preferences um, uh, specified by the, the youth panels um, early in the study. So uh, in this case, uh, participants voted on the, the terms of, of data access, but, uh, but data accessors could still download the data. Uh, and in the group D, uh, it was a democracy vote again um, and only server access. Next slide. Uh, so if we look at the rate of joining across uh, not just those three, but also the, the first model in which participants got to, got to uh, choose their, their options, we see that uh, there's, there's actually not a statistically significant difference across all of those four models in in every country, actually. Um, so this was a, a huge surprise to us. We thought that, you know, researcher norms that group B would be less preferable um, than than the other models. But we we find that uh, essentially once a, a participant, a potential participant starts the enrollment, uh, there's an equal chance of, of joining or not joining. Um, next slide. Uh, so there's another place where participants had choices, um, not just those in group uh, group A. Um, there were also the participants who uh, uh, got uh, assigned or chose democracy. Um, so that those are um, group C and D, as well as the the people in group A who chose um, chose voting. Um, next slide. So. Uh, here's what they voted on. Um, the first two questions are about profit and payment. Um, can my data be used by researchers to make a profit? Um, in Across all countries, um, participants uh, chose that they did not want their data to be used um, to make a profit. Um, and then do people have to pay to use the data? Uh, again, uh, largely, um, Participants chose that only um, commercial entities should have to pay to use the data. Um, next slide. Uh, and then data use, how can my data be used? Um, either broad research purposes, uh, health research only, mental health research only, or I don't care. Uh, participants in um, India and South Africa uh, preferred that their data only be used for mental health research. Uh, participants in UK were a little bit more uh, lenient in allowing their data to be used for broad um, health research. Next slide. So uh, just a summary on that section. Um, participants did have preferences about um, governance questions. questions. Um, and sometimes these preferences differed by country. So not, not every country showed the same preferences. Um, but when it came to acceptability, those prefer preferences didn't translate into less willingness to participate um, under those less preferred conditions. 
Uh, next slide. So now we're going to talk about engagement. Um, uh, this wasn't just an exercise in enrollment, but there actually was a, a study app. Um, next. So we're going to look at uh, uh, participants' engagement in that study app. Um, so once they enrolled on the website, uh, we prompted them to download the data, download the study app. Um, it's an Android-based app um, for this, this uh, pilot study. It was only Android. Um, so they were directed to the Google Play Store to, to download and install the app. Um, next slide. So uh, within the app, we actually had another uh, randomized trial. Um, this is a, a bit of a busy slide, um, uh, and we're not going into the full uh, protocol here. For the In the interest of time, you can go to um, our protocol paper to read um, read more in depth about that. Um, but uh, in terms of the the trial um, that we uh, implemented within the app, um, there were two two study arms. Essentially, one arm got to choose the topics that they addressed during their their um, course of their study. Um, so that's arm one. Um, and then ARM2 was randomly assigned to th their topics. Um, and I will say that these topics are based on um, Welcome's active ingredients research. And so, again, you can read more about that in our protocol paper, um, but we don't have time to discuss that today. Um, so I'll cut to the chase. Uh, the, the long story short is we were super surprised here as well. Um, we thought that participants who got their their choice of study topics would engage more, and we actually saw the opposite. Um, so here we see that ARM2, which uh, was the fixed um, fixed protocol or the assigned topics, um, actually stayed in the study longer. Um, so higher on this this curve means that they um, stayed in the study longer. Uh, so that was that was hugely surprising to us. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, just a couple other brief um, results. Um, you'll be able to read more of them in the um, in the final report. We don't have time to go through them all. Uh, but just to say that uh, folks who identified as having um, lived experience with mental health challenges showed actually pretty similar engagement with uh, with those without, even though they enroll in the study at a much higher rate, um, they seem to uh, participate pretty similarly, though there is a little bit of a quicker drop off. Um, uh, um, but they, they soon catch up. Um, next slide. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, looked at consent models to see if those consent models that they were exposed to on enrollment had any effect on engagement, um, and they don't, um, similar, similarly to our, our preference um, our preference results. So, um, so that's all I'm going to be able to talk to you about, about today, but like I said, we have a lot more results in the, in the um, final report. So now that we've heard about these kind of complicated engagement results, what in the qualitative study has something to say about the engagement in the quantitative study? Um, it may be this tension that we saw in the qualitative study between the benefits of data sharing and the risks of data sharing, which makes a lot of sense. We saw this tension emerge independently of the quantitative study. So these two studies were conducted separately and analyzed separately without communication about analysis between the two teams. So something that we saw emerge inductively from the qualitative data is a tension between the benefits of data sharing and the risks of data sharing. And this tension is populated by a few themes. If we go to the next slide. So under the benefits of data sharing, participants articulated a desire to normalize, destigmatize, and start conversations around mental health and they also expressed a desire to protect and understand mental health. But they're weighing that against a concern over leaky data or lost data, 
a spectrum of sensitive and non-sensitive data, and they typically articulated mental health data as being on the sensitive side and thus needing more parameters. And a fear of losing or a disbelief in anonymity, which is a pretty sophisticated theme that we saw that we'll talk about more in a moment. So let's just talk about the benefits of data sharing. And that's on the next slide. So I have a quote for you. There's still a lot of stigma around mental illness. Most people think it's witchcraft or it's just something that is weird. So I think it, it would be safer to, for like professionals in specific, to have such information in order, in order for them to modify, change things. And for the public as well, for their personal growth and to know how to seek help when they, when they actually need help. What I like about this quote is it really shows you the stakes that participants are envisioning um, when they talk about normalizing, destigmatizing, and starting conversations around mental health that could happen as a result of a global mental health data bank and the kind of insights derived therein. So this is the, the kind of gravity of the benefits that participants are imagining. But then they're weighing this against the risks. And that's on the next slide. One misuse I can think of is that if the private company gets access to people's IDs, et cetera, then using internet or social media, they can reach people through advertising. For example, when we log into any app, then you get more advertisements of that app, like get that app, log into that app, and there are so many offers. So this quote is a really sophisticated articulation of how participants are aware that they're part of a digital ecosystem and that they know that this particular data set collected for a global mental health data bank is not the only data set out there, um, sometimes collected consensually or, con or collected non-consensually. And um, participants recognize that when multiple anonymous data sets are combined in the era of big data, people can potentially be re-identified and they could lose their anonymity. And participants see this in the form of targeted ads that follow them across apps based on sometimes non-consensually collected information. So this is the way in which participants are making a risk benefit analysis. But it gets a bit deeper than that, and we'll go to the next slide. So we saw a parallel tension between controlling the data and access to the data and feeling unable to control the data access and feeling a sense of resignation. And we just grabbed resignation. Um, sometimes my colleague Emily and I talked about this as like the try to break the data bank phenomenon when we would offer a particular intervention to participants, like maybe an ID check. Sometimes participants would say, well, you could forge an ID. And we understood this as a sense of deep resignation about how much data is out there and maybe how many bad actors are out there. And we related this to what we called a nefarious undercurrent in behavior. This idea that different actors in the data bank always have this kind of nefarious intent. And the way that I distinguish this tension from the risk benefit tension is that the risk benefit tension is fundamentally about the data, the benefits of the data and the risks to the data if it's out there. Controlling the data and access versus being unable to control the data and access is fundamentally about the people. And when we talk about controlling the data, we're really talking about controlling the people who have access to the data and being unable to control the people who have access to the data. So this tension is also populated by a few themes on the next slide. So under control the data and access, we saw a desire for skilled access, like that someone has the right background to access the data, a fear of unequal access, like that a, a functionally equal policy will affect people unequally because of social inequality, real value-based discussions about who pays and who is getting paid, who derives the financial benefit of the data bank, and then also um, some concerns around where the data lives, like the physical or geographic location of the data. And we heard sometimes places that participants would not want the data to live. And then under can't control the data access, um, we saw participants talking about the ways in which researchers and systems have historically rendered themselves untrustworthy, as well as the concern that corruption is present or that bad actors are everywhere. So let's talk about control the data and access. So here's a quote. 
So whether it's hosted in one place or many places, as long as the right people have access to the data and can make a difference, it doesn't really matter. So this is a quote that shows me that controlling the data is about controlling the people who have access to the data. Because this participant says, look, whether it's hosted in one place or many places, it's not that big of a deal. As long as the right people have access to the data, that's what really matters. And so when we talk about different interventions in the data bank, what we really found that participants were talking about are controlling what interventions you can make such that the right people have access to the data bank. But it's pretty challenging to identify who the right people are because of this other tension on the next slide. So here's a quote. We've seen that people sometimes manipulate data to use it for their own unsolicited or unscrupulous you know, research. So for example, I think it was in the 70s that it was deemed that Black people, uh, the Black people were seen as people who couldn't get depression. And also I think about 30 years ago, it was seen that being gay or being homosexual was a mental illness. So I think that certain things are due to all how we've seen how history has played out. So this is what makes it so challenging to identify who the right people are, because the wrong people do not always look like the hackers who wear a ski mask and they're in a dark room somewhere, although participants were also concerned about this. Sometimes the wrong people historically have worn white coats and they have worked in a lab and they have had a PhD and they have produced research that is harmful to marginalized communities. So because of the ways in which researchers and systems historically have rendered themselves untrustworthy to potential participants, it makes it very complicated to identify the right actors in the data bank. And that's why if we go to the next slide, this was our full analysis framework for the qualitative study. Um, so we have these two tensions and their constituent themes interacting with each other. And this is the very thick milieu in which participants were located when they think about a global mental health data bank. So we use this framework to analyze all of our qualitative data. And you can see a lot more quotes in the final report. Carly, thanks so much for that. Um, so just as a highlight of what we saw, just to remind you of some of the things that we've seen today, um, certainly we saw that youth have nuanced and thoughtful preferences about how their data is managed and used. We expected in the quantitative study for data governance model to impact the acceptability, but we didn't see that. And we wonder if youth have been conditioned to accept what they're given online might be worth some more research there. Um, we expected uh, giving youth a choice of study topics would improve their engagement, but we actually saw the opposite. Um, and then some data that we didn't get into today, uh, what we saw when we gave uh, youth had preferences about different active ingredient topics, but assigning more unpopular topics didn't result in less engagement. And uh, Joe has dropped a copy of the final report um, in the chat for you, so you can read more about Sally and Carly's findings um, and the work of um, our teams around the world in um, our, our detailed final report. So let's talk a little bit about the learnings that we've had. Um, we're going to move right into learnings from our professional youth advisors. Sweta? Thank you so much, Meg. Hi, everyone. Um, so as you know, involving young people with lived experiences of mental health challenges has been central to the MindKind study. Here are some important learnings that we had on youth engagement through professional youth advisors. So PYAs or professional youth advisors were hired as full members of the research team. They were recruited and helped in developing and facilitating in-country youth panels. They organized and led bi-monthly panel meetings, recorded key findings in the study Airtable database, and conducted capacity building activities also reported back to the youth panel members on key project decisions. Aside from this, PYAs helped with the collection of data for both qualitative and quantitative studies and helped in carrying out framework analysis for the qualitative study. Recruiting PYAs earlier would give them more say in decision making and setting the involvement agenda on a project 
enabling improvements in capacity, skill set, and experience. This also ensures that all points of a project timeline can be informed by youth insights and that there is a continuation of involvement from application to delivery phases. Despite being full members of the research team, the unequal power dynamics of working within an established research team was a challenge for many of the youth. An option could be to have a central youth integration lead or team on such projects to ensure consistency and communication with the central team leading the research consortium. This person or team would be responsible for onboarding, enabling and supporting youth involvement, as well as support with escalating any concerns that are held by PY is about the project. Meg, if we can move to the next slide. One of the main mechanisms for youth involvement in the Mindkind study was the Young People's Advisory Group, or the Youth Panel. Each in-country site had a YPAC, which comprised of a group of young people between the ages of 18 to 24 in India and South Africa, or 16 to 24 in the UK. Here are some important learnings that we had on youth engagement with the help of our youth panels. To support a feedback loop, Mindkind tried to ensure that research teams provided feedback directly to the youth panels, as well as used a feedback mechanism through a, a mechanism called Airtable to communicate how insights were or were not being actioned. However, professional youth advisors noted that if there is a lack of continu continuity between earlier and later youth involvement infrastructure, it can make decision making less transparent and perceived as more prescriptive. It's also important for us to note that online spaces are not always suitable or accessible for youth involvement. With panelists requiring a digital device with a stable internet connection, um, this is not usually accessible for youth around the world. In some contexts, there was regular load shedding, which aims to manage high demand for electrical power. Load shedding could lead to internet and power being cut in a particular area for an unspecified time, thus impacting access to the internet and therefore youth involvement. With the project spanning three diverse geographic contexts, it is important for us to think about the benefits and drawbacks to maybe online only engagement and whether it makes more sense for us to facilitate a hybrid model of youth involvement. While youth involvement becomes increasingly popular in mental health science and research, it is important to recognize that you do not all have access to the skills to thrive during involvement. In the Mindkind study, capacity building sessions were supported by PYAs and members of the central team. Additional support, for example, provision of letters of reference for youth involved in the project were also needed and appreciated. Research teams can usually help in bridging this gap by using plain language, pop culture references, avoiding research jargon, and actively building trust while building their capacity. Some of the responsibilities of the PYAs related to providing emotional or pastoral support to youth who had over time developed a sense of familiarity, comfort, and trust with the PYAs. As such, it's important for us to understand how youth can access emotional and pastoral support through their involvement. So within this, um, safeguarding and role boundaries should be considered, but not at the cost of dismissing this kind of uh, support that needs to be provided to uh, youth panel members. Whether through access to well-being apps, psychoeducation, or career support, YPAC members should be provided with ways of supporting themselves whilst demonstrating long-term involvement in the study. So we hope that these learnings and recommendations will help in improving our future approaches to youth involvement in mental health research, as well as in complex international studies at the intersection of young people's mental health and data. Thank you. Swetha, thanks so much for that. Um, we were so fortunate to have professional youth invite at, um, advisors, PYAs, as members of our study team who are full-time employees. And again, um, had uh, they each facilitated a youth panel, and those youth panels contributed, as Sweta has pointed out, and as Emily and Rafilaway um, spoke about earlier in our talk, they contributed mightily um, to the work that we did. So this research project would not have been as rich as it was, um, or really um, been able to be as meaningful as it turned out to be without their involvement. We also had involvement from, you know, each of these three sites, India, South Africa, and the UK, and each of the sites had their own experiences. We're going to hear from uh, principal investigators at each of those sites now um, to 
share with us some of their learnings from their particular sites. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Sumitra. Sumitra. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, hi, hi everyone. I'm going to try and just uh, tell you some of the challenges that we had uh, uh, with with our study, and I'm not going to cover everything. Some of it has been covered by Shweta in terms of what happened with the youth engagement, but there are a couple of things that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, one is the whole issue around Indian regulatory uh, uh, regulatory framework, if I can put that. Those of who work and live in India would know that uh, all international studies, especially multi-country studies, have to go to an extra layer of regulatory approvals. Uh, and there were challenges in getting some of these regulatory approvals, largely because this was a digital uh, intervention. It wasn't actually designed as a study to collect data uh, about people's mental health, but about people's understanding of what data collection would mean. And I think uh, the regulatory authorities also had challenges in understanding the methodology and the statistical analysis that would be needed. You know, it wasn't a efficacy or a RCT kind of a study that they might have been used to. Uh, so one of the things that I think it raises uh, questions for us uh, going forward is not just in places like India, but many other countries like India and low and middle income countries where these regulatory bodies may not be uh, up to date when one is doing studies like this or do not have the uh, the capacity to be able to uh, appropriately evaluate the regulatory issues that might come in with multi-country studies such as the mind study. So that was one thing and that did require a lot of back and forth uh, between us and the regulatory authorities and we finally got the approval. Uh, but I think it just highlights the fact that a certain amount of training and help for the regulatory authorities is also required. Uh, if I can move to the next slide, please. Uh, our recruitment from India. Now, most of our recruitment, almost 80 or 90 percent of our in, uh, recruitment happened from social media and particularly uh, from a paid promotion on Instagram. Uh, now that by itself uh, raises all sorts of questions because uh, the people who 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 manage who are recruited into a study like this or who participate in a study like this clearly are not representative of all young people in the country and one is always concerned that uh, what happens in recruitments which happen like this is that particularly marginalized groups uh, are excluded from that and going forward imagine if this was a data bank which was running and the only people who are joining in were uh, young privileged urban english speaking folks from uh, different cities in india uh, the data that would be there would not necessarily represent all young people uh, in india and especially marginalized groups in india and there's a danger that researchers then end up drawing uh, inappropriate or incorrect uh, conclusions out of that data uh, Clearly, we had language issues. The app was only available in English. Uh, there were time constraints for uh, when we had to recruit uh, participants and some technology related issues. One of the things with the technology was that we we did have a, some participants were lost because the technology did not work as it was supposed to work. Uh, having said that, the, the participants who were lost were not necessarily uh, people from certain subgroups or marginalized groups, but were just the same representative group that that joined into the study. So I'm going to stop here and uh, hand it back to uh, uh, back to uh, Meg. Uh, thanks, Meg. Thanks so much, Sumitra. So now we're going to transition to uh, Zuki, who's going to share some findings from uh, South Africa. Zuki. Thank you so much, Meg, and uh, I must also share what an honor it was to work with the whole team on this project. Um, when we got involved, it sounded like such a huge uh, project that we weren't sure we were going to be able to pull it off. But uh, once we got into it, we were quite pleased at the amount of progress we were able to make, but more importantly, at also the capacity building aspects, such that by the end of the project, we had quite a, um, you know, a few uh, very experienced individuals because of their involvement in this project. So looking at um, the South African experience and learnings, 
We um, ran two sites in South Africa, one at Tire Health, uh, which is more, um, uh, you know, based in an urban area. And then the other one was in a more rural area, which was Walter Sisulu University in the eastern um, province um, of South Africa. So recruitment was mainly via social media, uh, very much similar to India. Uh, we also used radio advertisements and flyers, which were distributed via email, with the support of the university help desk. We also felt it was important to conduct some awareness campaigns about the project, which we raised via the radio station slot. And luckily for us, we had a radio uh, that was on site at the university. And um, we were able to get a paid slot for about 30 minutes, during which we were able to explain the aims and objectives of the study, as well as the recruitment inclusion criteria. And we found that after that particular slot, we had a, a significant increase in the uh, numbers which we could recruit. Um, and um, in general, we also found that what worked better when we communicated with the potential um, participants was using bulk SMSs, which were better than individual SMSs. Um, please, um, can we move to the next slide? Thanks. Um, if we then look at uh, some of the challenges, one major one that we were worried about was um, uh, the issue of uh, cost of data connectivity, because we know in South Africa, unfortunately, when compared to the other uh, partner or collaborative sites, South Africa's uh, cost for data was um, unaffordable at times. So how we handled that was to um, anticipate the um, projected costs for connectivity. We included those in the proposal that we submitted to the IRBs or um, uh, ethics committees. And we included a proposal uh, for remuneration of those costs uh, for participants, but also for the um, research team members who would be using their own data at times to connect. Um, and as a result, we found that the ethics committee members were quite understanding and we received approval to include that as well. Next slide, please. So if we look at the take home learnings, um, we know that um, as um, an academic um, environment, South Africa is ripe for multi-site research projects like this one. And um, we um, are therefore very, very, um, um, you know, proud to say this was an example of a project where we could once again partner successfully. Um, we felt it was important to highlight that attention to seamless coordination between sites and teams is crucial for success. And um, what can sometimes pose a challenge is that in some universities which are not that well resourced, grant management systems can um, sometimes affect such projects unless they are fully functional and immediately responsive to study and site needs, which would then enable large projects of this nature to run smoothly. Um, we also found that um, if research uses technical or medical terms which require robust translation, then we should be very um, conscious of that and make sure that this is done for the benefit of participants because we feel that that empowers participants to ensure informed consent. Next slide, please. If we then look at uh, the uh, difficult to understand jargon uh, and the difficulty in trying to translate these, especially if one considers that some of the indigenous languages are not as well developed in these particular areas. One of the suggestions we have is to say, when we are developing information leaflets for participants, it may be a better idea to start off conceptualizing those uh, information leaflets in the indigenous Indigenous language first and then translate those to English because um, translating from an Indigenous language into English for these tricky um, areas or disciplines is actually an easier process than trying to translate uh, from English to the Indigenous language. And um, this is something that uh, can apply not only to this study but to other studies in general where there's a lot of technical language that is um, anticipated uh, to be used. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. And, and this is basically to highlight that one of the areas that I'd already indicated was a challenge was the fact that uh, data was so expensive in South Africa. 
Um, and, um, you know, if possible, there should be different ways that uh, researchers um, come up with to try and mitigate those costs. And then um, lastly, um, it is advisable to have a senior on-site supervisor to um, assist and uh, supervise the research team just in case there are immediate problems that need um, to be attended to. And we also advocate for a quality assurance process um, if the team has to deal with very technical stuff that requires a lot of um, attention to detail. And um, with that, once again, I'd like to say what a pleasure it was to work not only with our international partners, but also our local team at Higher Health, which include quite a number of young people who approach this study in a very robust, energetic way that resulted in high productivity. So thank you very much. And back to you again, um, Meg. Thanks so much, Zuki. We were so lucky um, to have such collaboration from around the world. Um, our final site collaborators um, were based in the UK and we're gonna hear from Mina. Mina, take it away. Hi, thank you very much. So I'm Mina Fazel. I work at the University of Oxford, but this is um, a fabulous team that worked across the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. And I thought I'd just limit myself to some um, reflections and learnings that others haven't mentioned, because obviously we've all been kind of intimately associated with so many of the really exciting learnings. I remember when Lara Mangavit and Pamela Collins contacted us initially, I was struck by um, how open they both were to innovation and experimentation and learning. And I think the fruits of this um, study, along with the welcome, is that we were able to do some things in quite an innovative way um, with a very responsive group of individuals. And the first on that was just on the whole co-production, and you've heard from the professional youth advisors, but I do think kind of what we take away is that co-production has taken on a whole new meaning that actually what what can be meant now by co-production is just completely different leaving this project to how we entered it to actually have young people employed as integral parts of the research team what that means how they then facilitate um bringing in learnings from their youth advisory groups um, i think has been incredibly landmark and in helping us really understand what it means to invest in this um, level of hearing the young person's voice and how to embed the youth voice into the work that we're doing if we really want to help youth mental health. And I think what we're taking away from this is that we need to be really strategic in the areas that we want their impact so that we want it to be of maximal impact because our young partners definitely want to see the impact. So it felt like we needed to be accountable that, you know, they're giving really good advice. It's based on lived experience for a large number of them. And therefore, we as a research team also need to have processes in place first to assess the impact and then also to um, highlight what we have done with those suggestions. So I'd like to thank the 20 young people that were involved in our advisory groups, as well as um, Emily and her um, co-youth advisors across the site. So when it comes to recruitment, what I found quite interesting in the UK was that we were able, unlike the other sites, to recruit 16 and 17 year olds. And um, actually uh, almost half of those that we recruited, so we, we recruited 1,500 individuals to the um, app arm of the study, and actually half of those were 16 and 17. So actually how um, interesting it is that these are a, a, a group of individuals for whom the mental health needs are si significant and also who seem to be very keen to engage in this type of work. Um, and although there's poor penetration of Android in the UK market, so a lot of young people, you know, a lot of the areas we would go to, only 10% were using it, we were still able to get them in. And actually 91% of our sample also had lived experience. So actually we've got so much to learn from the data that has been gathered and, and that will be a process that hopefully we'll be able to share more and more of those findings with you. And similar to what India said about the importance of paid promotion through social media sites or whatever site is relevant to the age group in the country in which you're conducting your research. The second area is of retainment. So actually, um, at the outset, we would have hypothesized much, much lower retainment in the app. So, so many um, um, apps like this only kind of retain individuals maybe once, maybe a few times over the first week, but actually 34% of our sample remained engaged in the app. So actually, 
This is really interesting because in this study, for the 1,500 that were recruited to participate in the app, they had no um, external incentivization, by which I mean they weren't paid to participate in this type of trial, where actually in a lot of other similar trials, there has been some sort of financial incentivization. This group, actually, there was probably the internal reward, altruism, helping others, but actually there was no financial incentive. And how interesting it is that so many remained engaged. So there must have been a, a given that such a high number had lived experience, actually, you know, maybe we can think much more about um, the utility of such apps for these groups, because actually the engagement was much higher than um, we hypothesized at the beginning. And then finally, what's the implications for research? Well, uh, I feel really kind of hopeful that you know young people are very very clear they really want their data used that the altruistic voice is strong in the younger populations it always has been strong it's incredibly strong now they're aware of the mental health needs in society they're aware of how much we don't know and they're keen actually to be active participants in that and they want this maximally open data they really want the public good but also kind of fairness and access um, and kind of that's consistent with findings across other studies as well. So one young person said to us, if anyone can access it, there's far more likelihood that it would be useful. So, you know, let's get it out there. Let's make sure people can access it. But obviously they were also very, very care, uh, aware of the trust issues that have been discussed. So the importance of trustworthy, independent institutions with robust procedures and skilled individuals. They often mention not for profit. And so it's a kind of kind of the balance, as we've already been talking about, of making it accessible whilst also mitigating risk. And I was thinking, you know, we've been thinking in the UK what that means with regards to our national context and GDPR in the UK, um, and actually how the the legislation around uh, data access doesn't seem to reflect what young people actually seem to want. That actually young people seem to be much keener for this to happen than the legislation is allowing. Um, and young people are saying, you know, very global in their outlook. I feel like nowhere in the world should the data not be reached just because you're from a certain country. So I will end our reflections because we have a, a new government with a quote from a young person regarding the responsibility of institutions. And one young person said, if the research can help the general public, then the government should be contributing towards that just like they give money for the NHS. So if anyone in the new government will ever hear that, that's also what I think. This is crucial. It's crucial to the health of the nation to make data more accessible so that we can better understand and work together. So thank you very much. I had an incredible team that I had the privilege of working with in the UK. Um, and um, back to you, Meg. Thanks so much, Mina. Thanks to everyone um, who has presented so far today. Uh, we walked through um, some really rich data. We learned about um, youth involvement from our professional youth advisors themselves. We heard from each of our sites um, about specific findings and reflections that they have from their sites. As we close up, just some food for thought from our side, from the Sage Bio Network's perspective, um, and, uh, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. Um, this is a quote directly um, from Emily, one of our professional youth advisors. The data bank needs to be a living, breathing thing. Um, over and over, we heard from youth about their different uh, preferences and, and the acceptability of, of different data governance models. Um, but over and over and over again, they came back to this idea of the data bank being adaptive to youth needs over time and and to the changing in world in which we live. Um, and if we can ask you to take away anything, it's that um, when we design these types of massive research repositories, we need to really think carefully about how we make them adaptive to the people who are contributing their data um, and to the regulatory environments in which they work. A few really quick take home points. Um, we really um, suggest that you integrate youth across the research life cycle um, using dedicated tools and features. You build for inclusion. We heard this over and over today at uh, devices, internet, electricity, language were all barriers in our study. Um, and there were some really um, great um, learnings, little uh, nuggets for you to take home. 
conducting this research during a pandemic, a global pandemic, was certainly not the easiest thing, um, but it did force us to go into the digital world entirely in all sites and, and with some trade-off there. Trust is a key factor in data governance, preference, and acceptability. We heard that loud and clear um, through our qualitative data, and we saw some evidence of that in our quantitative data. Um, that idea of trust as a foundation and being trustworthy um, to, uh, to engender this uh, relationship between data contributors and data users, I think is really, really important for researchers to keep at the front of their minds, as well as funders. Um, design governance for adaptation. There's going to be ch changing regulatory regimes and youth and researcher needs, as I pointed out already. Um, Sage Bio Networks has this thing called Mobile Toolbox. We suggest um, that uh, anybody who builds a large platform add in stuff like that, which allows researchers to customize and add in um, side studies. Um, we'll drop a link in the chat um, about that if you're interested in learning more. As you know by now, this has been a massive collaborative effort um, from teams in India, South Africa, and the UK, as well as our partners at the University of Washington here in the United States, um, and the giant team at Sage Bionetworks. First and foremost, though, our professional youth advisors, Sweta Rafilaway and Emily, um, were cornerstones of this project. We never would have been able to do it without them. Huge acknowledgement to all who were involved so many thanks to everyone. Um, and with that, we'd love to hear more from you. Um, we have time for conversation now. We have 15 more minutes um, in this Zoom room or in this Teams room if you'd like to stay for a Q&A. Um, or you can reach out to me directly or to the other researchers involved. Uh, we're happy to talk more about this project. All right, thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, and anyone who uh, would like to add, ask a question, raise a hand or put something into the chat. Um, we're happy to talk more with you. To get things started, Sally, was it okay if I ask you a question? Are you going to throw me under the bus, Meg, or lob <laughs> me a softball? <laughs> well, so um, we were really surprised by the quantitative study results. Um, can you, do you have any reflections about the quantitative study? Um, any thoughts about those really surprising results that we saw? Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's great that we do experiments like that. We had just assumed that, you know, you give people a choice and they're going to be more engaged, right? So it was a huge shock to see that it actually resulted in less engagement. And so that's why we do studies like this, right? It's, you know, because our assumptions as researchers are not necessarily what, what you know, youth want or what, you know, how they're going to react. So you know, it just shows the importance of this this kind of work. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. Um, it was it was uh, such an exciting reveal when you finally shared those quantitative results because we had kept the qualitative and quantitative um, streams separate from one another so that we would have authentic al analysis on both sides. Um, Carly, do you mind if I call you back to the conversation for a little more reflection? Sure. So as you learned about the quantitative study results, what were your thoughts having just come out of the qualitative analysis and co-analysis with all of the youth um, advisors? Um, I think I was a bit, I think that I was prepared for the kind of complexity and muddiness of the quantitative results because that's what we found in the qualitative study as well, especially what we found in the deliberative outcomes, you know, what I presented in that aggregate figure. Something that was a bit of a surprise to me, although perhaps a bit naive, was that we didn't have super bright lines um, 
in terms of preferences, we had kind of trends in preferences, but we did not have, uh, we didn't have areas where everyone said, this is what we want, this is our preference. And so, um, so then when the complexity of the quantitative results became revealed, it kind of, um, I don't know, it kind of felt like they were like two birds of a feather a little bit. And then once we went into analyzing the qualitative study data more deeply, then we saw the real thickness of the data and why it may be challenging for participants to, why it may be challenging to produce these bright lines because of these different thematic interactions. Yeah, yeah, I think that it points to the importance of trust. And I'm wondering, Sumitra, Zuki, Mina, if you're still on the line, if you wouldn't mind um, coming back to the conversation, um, just to have some reflections on that theme of trust from your perspectives. So um, how do you feel like this theme of trust, the importance of trust and trustworthiness, um, is that congruent with your experience in your country, um, your expectations for the data? Sumitra, do you want to start? Yeah, happy to go first. Uh, I, I think the, the, the data and the, the kind of stuff that young people have been saying around trust, I think it, it kind of reflects with the general discourse that goes on in the country uh, at the moment around data and data production. You have to remember that India does not actually have a data production law. Leave aside a strong data production law, we don't have any data production law. So, so clearly that then uh, creates all kinds of questions for young people and that that's quite understandable. My concern, uh, my only concern though is that a concern and a bit of disappointment actually. Um, you know, it's very clear that young people uh, are engaging, you know, the engagement in the qualitative, qualitative study is excellent. Uh, the engagement in terms of wanting to be part of this kind of research and uh, uh, you know, the number of people who signed up to participate is, is an indicator of that. What surprises me, and maybe it shouldn't surprise me, uh, is that uh, retention does not kind of retention is has been a challenge uh, and even for young people for young people to even stay in on a study which they really enjoyed probably doing or wanted and they always want to be doing uh, six weeks seems like a long engagement. I think that's a reflection of how uh, how engagement and attention uh, is retained on on social media. So you know, in a sense, what I mean is that we had recruited a lot of people from social media. Uh, so there's always a possibility that you recruited a certain kind of people uh, uh, who are on social media and who then have you know their attention spans tend to be lower or or they would change attention from one to the other. And maybe if we had recruited a more general population, then that would be a very we might get a different response. I I don't know. I'm just speculating out here since you wanted me to speculate I'm speculating. <laughs> that's great thanks Sumitra <laughs> Sally I see you have a comment and then Zuki will go to you yeah I just wanted to comment about the engagement since you brought it up Sumitra um our research uh, the research out of our team is that this age group is historically the hardest to uh ret retain and so we were actually surprised that we you know relative to previous studies we we got really good engagement um you know can we do better absolutely and we'd love to do more research in gamification and other other means of of retaining um participants but we were really um pleased with with these results thank Zuki. you and uh, thank you so much Meg. Um, if i can then just give a perspective from uh, where we are um, look, this this uh, study came, um, you know, in the midst of COVID, and we know what happened to trust, um, you know, you know um, levels of trust in the um, um, broader scientific community, meaning between uh, lay people and the broader scientific community. And as a result, therefore, um, you know, we were surprised at um, our ability to recruit so well, despite what was going on in the background of COVID. So that was a good thing. 
And then the other thing to mention is what also made a, a difference with us was um, making time to do the radio interaction also seemed to make a difference because um, somehow, um, I suppose because the radio is always, um, you know, somewhere in the background of your home, you hear it every day. Um, it's probably perceived as more trustworthy. I have no idea, but we did find that recruitment seemed to go up when we went to the radio. And then lastly, just to, to also mention that the fact that there was an association of this kind of study with universities, which are trusted entities, also seemed to make a difference. So, um, you know, in terms of trustworthiness, I think we got off um, lucky specifically because of the difficult period we were going through. And, and yet, despite that, we were able to um, recruit and, and get people who would engage um, despite the challenges with electricity, despite the challenges with um, data costs. So all, all in all, I would say it was quite a, a positive experience for us um, despite the challenges. Thanks. Thanks, Yuki. Mina, did you have any reflections you wanted to share? I just think um, thinking about the, the qualitative sessions and what the young people told us there, I think accountability was a really big theme that also came up that um, mm -hmm. they felt that, you know, there are always going to be problems and difficulties with trust. They're more aware than most um, generations before them about the dangers of hacking, of you know data being put in the wrong hands, but they felt that with trusted institutions and accountability inbuilt in that, that actually they would feel that a lot of the risks were mitigated. So that was one other thought. Great, thanks so much for that. Miranda, I see you have your hand up and then Joe, I see that you probably have some questions for us in the chat. Uh, Miranda? Do you want to start and then just, we'll go to Joe? Was, no, it was just to point out that there was a question in the chat. Just wanted you to see. Ah, that was all. OK, there we go. Yes. And uh, Joe, do you want to read out the question? Sure. Uh, the question is curious there if there were any distinct patterns of education, urban or rural or household income or other demographics when comparing the three countries. Could the fact these variables being similar lead to the surprising findings quantitatively? Sally, do you want to speak to that? We didn't delve too deeply into um, demographics beyond uh, the ones that they uh, pr they uh, 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 gave us during the enrollment. Um, I did peek in a little bit to socioeconomic status um, and saw that that was not a necessarily a factor in retention. Um, we, of course, did didn't compare these across countries because, uh, you know, they're very difficult to compare across um, across these three very disparate um, countries. But uh, we did see, um, at least with respect to socioeconomic status, we did see um, some variation and we saw um, similar retentions. So um, that was interesting. All right. Any other questions before we close for today? Shuba, thanks for that great question. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I hope I didn't uh, interrupt anyone's hand up. I can't see all 70 people. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question came out of the curious and curiosity that, and I also noticed the comments uh, that many of the speakers made about using a certain platform or type of platforms, as we all know, in some ways has catches the same type of people and I've always been struck mm -hmm. by what I call the global similarity of uh, of um, uh, the youth across various nations not to homogenize them in any way but also that there is a greater similarity that you might see across nations when you come from similar socioeconomic and other uh, um, digitally engaged uh, um, uh, communities or, or groups. And so I was wondering if we are seeing a sim that being reflected here um, across the ways we are seeing very similar views about acceptability, trust, um, uh, and even uh, recruitment and engagement. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, Shuba, I, I, to your to your point exactly, and to Sumitra's point um, that he's dropped in the chat, we know certainly that the youth that were recruited in our studies, because of the virtual platform, because of the device requirements, because of the access requirements, um, are not representative of all of the youth within their nation. Um, I think 
at the same time that these findings do help us to understand some of the broad directions um, that youth are thinking about um, as we engaged um, deeply in the quantitative in the qualitative study with youth um, we really saw such sophisticated thinking um, and such deep thinking about these issues um, we feel comfortable that they at least provide some guide points to us. Carly, were you going to make points to that effect? Yeah, I was going to add, um, I know you asked about the quantitative study. One privilege that we were able to have in the qualitative study was we were able to recruit non-English speaking participants in India. Um, and the um, India team did a wonderful job of getting us a phenomenally diverse sample. And we were able to conduct focus groups in two um, regional languages, as one is one, as well as one multinational session where we had live translation um, between English speaking and non-English speaking participants. And we did find some differences in trends in preferences. We found that um, in the regional language speaking populations, um, we found a real desire for the accessibility of the data bank to the broadest number of people possible and a real concern about financial barriers to participation. Um, and so that did add a lot of richness, particularly to the India data set. So I think that there perhaps is more to discover there if we expand beyond just English. Yeah. So we refer all of you to the Mindkind final report. It's um, there in the chat. Please take a look at it. It's exhaustive, voluminous, and might provide uh, more exciting insights uh, for you and uh, more interest for conversation. Thank you again to all of our speakers today and all of the people who attended. We so appreciate um, your involvement, and we would be happy to hear from you to talk more about this research. Many thanks to all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.